Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, we're going to be looking at a few things. Obviously, we're finishing off what we were doing tomorrow. So we're going to look at Miller's understanding of the 1260s uh, for, for paganism, right? So for the pagan powers. Now, Miller's understanding is not quite correct. It is there's things, that he, details that he didn't understand and, and some things that he just, well, he just got wrong, but he has the right idea. So, so it's not like he's completely wrong. He just didn't understand a few things. But we know that Miller was given, you know, these, these uh, prophecies. So we're going to look at these. But before we do that, let's begin with the word of prayer. The dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the time that we have to open your word together, and we invite your spirit to teach us. I know, Lord, that there's much that we do not understand, and uh, we ask for wisdom and understanding. Um, we know that the wise will understand, but the wicked will not. And we pray, Lord, that we can be among the wise. We pray for one another. You know the trials that we face in our lives. And we need um, your presence. Be with us now through thy spirit. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So um, when we were finishing off yesterday, we had a discussion about the 45 years. And so I, I did draw up a chart, but I'm going to read again what we had read. And then we're going to look at what Miller was saying about these periods. Uh, and there's some interesting little details that uh, Stephen brought up that I'm going to mention as well. We'll see how that fits together. So that's what Iran and I were trying to figure out. That's why we started a little bit late. I was trying to figure some things out. Okay, so um, on page 45 of Dissertation of the True Inheritance of the Saints, we're going to have this comment here. Now, I guess technically this paragraph starts on page 44, but moves to page 45. Now, if we can find a fulfillment of these things in the history of Manasseh, we cannot err. Second Chronicles 33, verse 9 to 11. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hear him, wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captain of the host of the kings of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. This captivity took place in the year before Christ, 677. Now, just as an aside to this, Miller in, in getting this date, 677, I mean, this is the only date that has ever been given for the captivity of Manasseh. Now, different people have speculated on, on a, that, that he wasn't taken captive in 677, based upon Thiel's chronology, but they don't actually have a year in which Manasseh is taken captive. That is, people don't actually give a date who rejects 677. They just say, we don't know the date. And we do have Prism B, where S.R. Hayden, speaks of taking Manasseh and, you know, 22 kings from the sea coasts um, captive, and he gets them to work as slaves, hauling timber uh, to Nineveh. And, and so it's pretty clear that where he, and he musters them, that is, uh, Adkima is the Assyrian word, which is to collect either armies or, soul, or, or um, slaves or building materials. The word Adkima is the basically best translated in the English word to muster. So if you muster your troops or you muster an army. So he takes these 22 kings and he brings them somewhere and then he sends them out to haul timber to Nineveh. So the place that he would most likely have mustered them to would be Babylon, which he had just finished rebuilding. So he finished rebuilding Babylon in 678. Now, some people date Prism B as 678, but most date it as 677. There are some people who try to date it a few years later, like 6, 674. But 677 is, is the best date that we can have for this Prism B when Manasseh was taken captive. So 
Miller didn't know all of that. They didn't have Prism B in his day. And, and many people, who, the skeptics, uh, would say, well, you know, this idea that Manasseh was taken captive and carried <coughs> by the king of Assyria to Babylon makes no sense. Why would the king of Assyria bring him to Babylon? But once they got Prism B and once they understood the history of, of Esser Hayden, that that's the only time when Babylon is like the temporary capital of Assyria. And Ellen White says that Manasseh was taken to Babylon, which was the temporary capital of Assyria. So it has to be in the time of Esser Hayden, according to Ellen White, if we believe the spirit of prophecy, that Manasseh was taken captive. But there is many people opposed to the 2520 who just don't want 677. And some of them even have used Prism B as say, see, he can't be in Babylon because the king of Assyria took him to Assyria, even though it doesn't say that, or took him to Nineveh. Well, it says they sent him out to haul timber to Nineveh, so we know he was in Nineveh in 677 as well as Babylon. So anyway, that's that's kind of an aside to the study, but just, you know, if anybody wants more information on that, I do have uh, papers that address that, the chronology of the Babylonian captivity, the studies on Leviticus 26, lots of papers I, I, I deal with Prism B. Anyway, so Miller goes on, he says, if this is the time when the kings of the earth began to rule over Zion and to scatter the power of the holy people for a time, times, and in half, or 1260 years, when will it end? Uh, I answer, when all these things shall be finished. So now, so he's taking that that passage in Daniel chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, and and he's saying, well, these have to end when when Christ comes back, right? But it's not talking about all these things shall be finished in regard to everything, right? So, so you'll see what I mean when we look at the chart. So he says, first, the kings exercised their authority 677 years before Christ and 538 years after Christ, which 677 added to 538 makes up 215 years only which did not accomplish the scattering of the holy people. And see, I would disagree that uh, the scattering of the power of the holy people had been accomplished by 538. Because the scattering of the power of the holy people is a reference to the Jews. And so it doesn't really make sense for him to, to put that in the 45 years. So we'll take a look at this a bit more. And then he says, nor the treading under the foot of the court 42 months or the 1260 years. So the treading under foot of the court 42 months or the 1260 years. And this is the reason why John was not to measure because it would not be fulfilled until mystical Babylon should wear out the saints and change times and laws to time, times and a half. So he's kind of overlapping these periods. He's taking that 45 years from the first part, saying, the 1260 years are not measured, right? And then the 45 years have to come in and finish in order for Christ to return and change times and laws a time, times and a half. For God hath put it in the heart, into the hearts of these kings to fulfill his will and to agree to give their kingdom until the mystery of Babylon or papal Rome, until the 1260 years of mystical Babylon should be fulfilled, which is 1260 years added to 538, when the kings became, became of one mind, converted to the Orthodox faith, gave up their power to the Bishop of Rome, and the power of the papacy began. It will carry down to the year 1798. So he's saying that 1260 years are kind of put in the in in between these 1260 years of the scattering of the power of the holy people. Uh, when the kings again took their power, and will now accomplish the scattering of the holy people. So he says it's going to be finished during that 45 years by reigning from A.D. 1798 to 1843, which is 45 years, add which to 1215, which the kings had reigned before mystical Babylon obtained the power. And we have 1260 years of the king's reign, scattering the holy people, treading underfoot the sanctuary and host, which is properly the court, where the host stands waiting the return of the treading underfoot, the sanctuary, and um, wait, waiting the return of our great high priest, right? So 
I'm not quite sure I fully understand his theology here of how he's fitting this together, but maybe somebody else can explain it better. Who will bless his people in turning every one of them from their sins and their iniquities in Zion. There is no wonder then that the angel told Daniel in 12, verse 12 and 13, blessed is he that waiteth and cometh, waiteth, that is, waiteth on the Lord and cometh to the thousand three hundred five and thirty days. But then the high priest of our profession will come out of his temple from his holy place and shake terribly the earth to dash in pieces the kings and kingdoms of this world as a potter's vessel to carry them away that no place on the earth should be found for them. Uh, but go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest, die, and stand in thy lot at the end of days. Then all those who have waited on and for the Lord will have part in the first resurrection, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven, etc. Okay, so, um, and then he's going to go on, uh, he's going to deal with the release uh, so he says, when will this glory be revealed? I answer at the end of these days, which is 45 years after the papacy lose her power over kings. And after she should be led into captivity by the kings of the earth, when the seven times should pass over the holy people. And when the seven years of bondage of the church shall be ended, for God has said at the end of every seven years, thou shalt make a release. And none can dis." But these were shadows of good things to come, and God will release his children at the end of seven years. And all must agree that the children of God have been in bondage almost seven prophetic years. I shall now show when the 1260 days have their fulfillment in Revelation 11, verse 3. And I will give power unto my witnesses, and they shall prophesy 1,203 score days clothed in sackcloth. Okay, so I'm not going to go further into this part. But you, you can see, um, hopefully you can see what he's talking about. So let's look at the, the diagram I made. So this diagram here just has, um, now he's he talked earlier about 742 BC and the 65 years. Now I put 722 here because I'm going to read another quote of his where he gives this uh, 722. So the chart's not complete at this point. And we can see then that oh, where am I doing this 677 so that's not 1260 so this here is that's the 1215 years right you can see that there so that's what he's talking about the 1215 added to the 45 equals 1260 so you can see that this all then equals 2520 he talks about the 1335 I can put the 1290 in there as well which goes here, actually we have the 1290, 1335, 1260, 215, 30. And then we know that there is this other 1260, but Miller doesn't have that, right? So he's got the, he takes this first 1260 from Daniel 12 or 7 as being made up of these two, right? So 1215 and the 45. So that's how he gets the 2520. So he's not considering this. Now he is, he does talk about the 65 years. So look at the 65 years, 65 years there. And we know that there's going to be 19 and 46. But I'm not going to put these in here. Let me see, how would I do this? Okay, so I'm going to put this. It's 20 and 45, because this is how Miller would see it, okay? And we'll kind of see why he he missed this and what what mistakes he's making. Okay, does that make sense, the chart? Did I do that all correct? And the other thing I need, to, so we're going to read some more of Miller. Okay, so this is from a, a lecture on the typical Sabbaths and the great jubilee. So most of us should be familiar with parts of this quote. He says, when then may we ask, did the children of the bondage of the children of God begin? I answer, when literal Babylon began to exercise authority over them in the 22nd year of Manasseh's reign, in the year before Christ, 677, 
and the last of the ten tribes were carried away, and Israel ceased to be a nation, according to the prophecy of Isaiah 7, verse 8. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is reason, and within threescore and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. Isaiah prophesied this in the year 7042 before Christ, which prophecy was literally fulfilled in 65 years afterward in the year B.C. 677. Then, too, Manasseh, king of Judah, was carried a captive into Babylon, and the threatenings of God began upon his people. Uh, so Second Kings 21, verse 10 to 14. And the Lord spake by his servants the prophets, saying, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, hath done these abominations, and hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did, which were before him, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whosoever heareth of it, of both his ears shall tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria, and the plummet of the house of Ahab. And I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. Now, one thing, of course, here is we have this line and this plummet, which we have also um, in Isaiah 28, right, dealing with uh, precept upon precept, line upon line, right? So you're going to see that that same idea in there. So I'll stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria. So the line of Samaria is the 2520 for northern Israel and the plummet of the house of Ahab. So the plummet refers to a waymark. On a line, and I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. And I will forsake the remnant of mine inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies, and they shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies. Surely at the commandment of the at the commandment of the Lord came upon surely at the commandment of the Lord came upon this came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he did, and also for the innocent blood that he shed, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. So that was uh, in chapter 24, verse 3 and 4 of Second Kings, that last part. And then uh, Miller goes on, and although Josiah, who was a king of Judah after Manasseh, did many good acts, yet the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his wrath against Judah. And then he's going to quote 2 Kings 23, verse 26 and 27. Notwithstanding, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah, because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him withal. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight, as I have removed Israel, and will cast off this city, Jerusalem, which I have chosen, and the house which I said, my name shall be there. The decree against Judah was the same as against Israel. They must be scattered among all nations. It could not be revoked, notwithstanding their repentance and partial reform. Uh, So he quotes Jeremiah 15, uh, 15, verse 4, And I will cause them to be removed into all kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for that which he did in Jerusalem tells us of the same thing, that Judah, as well as Israel, must be made captives. Israel began to be carried away in the days of Hoshea, 722 BC, and from that time to 1798 after Christ is exactly 2520 years, or the seven prophetic years. How remarkable that when the seven years ended, God began to deliver his church from her bondage which for ages had been made subject to the kings of the earth. In 1798, the church came out of the wilderness and began to be delivered from her captivity, but the completion of her slavery to the kingdoms of the earth is reserved for another period, beginning B.C. 677 years, um, seven prophetic years, or 25, 20 common years, would end in A.D. 1843. Therefore, the beginning of the captivity of Manasseh and the final dispersion of the ten tribes of Israel, where God has fixed the time for the dispersion of the people of God and the scattering of the holy people until the year 1843, will be the end of the seven years when the acceptable year of the Lord will commence. And, in my humble opinion, 
The children of God will be delivered from all the evils enumerated by Moses in Leviticus 26 and Jeremiah 15. From the war or the sword, from pestilence and famine, from captivity and spoil, from death and corruption, and will be comforted, and all the tears be wiped from off all faces. Sighs and sorrows shall cease forever, and there shall be no more curse, for the throne of the Lamb shall be there, and he shall dwell with them, and be their God, and they shall be his people. This will take place in the acceptable year of the Lord, the antitypical anti year of release. Okay, so he's going to go into... 6,000 years and stuff like that. So hopefully we can see what he's missing. I, I mean, we should be able to see it because we, we already understand this. So when it talks about stretching over a Jude, uh, Jerusalem, the line of Samaria, well, that would mean that the line of Samaria must also be 25, 20 years, which in, in Miller's understanding then, he has 722. Now, you'll still commonly see 722 for the fall of Samaria, but that's not the correct date for the fall of Samaria. And, and I don't know if I've ever presented a study on that, uh, specifically showing why it's incorrect, um, that it's actually 721 for the fall of Samaria, and that uh, Hoshi is taken captive two years before that. But uh, what we have... Oh, I see, you got that upside down. Look for that. What, what we have as a record in the, in the Assyrian records is that you have in 722 in December, Shalmaneser V is going to die and Sargon II is going to uh, take the throne. And since the Bible just mentions Shalmaneser but not Sargon, people just say, well, you know, that 722, that was under Shalmaneser. But what Sh Sargon's going to finish the siege, he's actually going to be the one that, that destroys Samaria, not Shalmaneser. And he's going to do it in the spring of 721. And, and we, we can date his, his reign because there's recorded a two different lunar eclipses, uh, in, in that, uh, first year of his reign so so it's 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 so well dated but yet people don't understand the details and so they will just put you know 722 and and it's sort of sometimes a compromise date as well because you have um, edwin thiel who tries to argue at 723 because he says sargon has nothing to do with it it's all under shalmaneser <coughs> and his arguments don't make any sense but a lot of people just say, well, you know, either 721, 723, 722, people just accept it. So you just see that date thrown around all the time. But that's the date Miller has. Now we know because there's no zero year that that doesn't, that doesn't fit, right? So it wouldn't be 25, 20 years. Even, uh, 677 to 1843 would be 25, 19 years, right? So, but this is Miller's understanding. That's what we put down here. So he, he mentions all of these dates. He mentions the 1335, the 1290, the 1260, the 215, the 45. Um, and then he gives 742, 722, 677. So that's how it would look in, in Miller's understanding. Is, is this diagram help? Does this make it a lot clearer for people? What Miller understood? So Miller has all of this, right? Everything, everything here is from Miller, but he doesn't fully understand that the line of Samaria must be that there is 1260 years there. So what he doesn't notice is in his understanding, in the way that he's put this together, that there should be 1260 years in his count from 722 to 538. I'm just going to move this over a little bit, make it more proportional. Does that make sense? So he sees all of this, but he doesn't see it. He doesn't see what he's missing. And we do, right? And even Hiram Metzen in 1856, when he starts addressing this period, 
So let's go here. So Miller should have seen that um, he had another 1260. But he doesn't, for some reason, he doesn't seem to notice that, right? He doesn't th say, ah, oh, we have two 1260s. And that maybe we should count that first 1260 for the scattering of the power of the holy people, right? Make sense? So he doesn't see that. He sees the 2520. He sees the 1290, the 1335. He sees this 1260. He sees that 30. He sees the 45. He sees this 2520 on top. He sees the 215 years. But instead of attributing that time times and then half of Daniel 12 or 7 to this period from 722 to 538, he splits it up. Does that make any sense what he did? Because I, I say it makes no sense what he's doing. When he's taking the 1260 and breaking it into 215 and 45 and separating them by a period of 1260 years to get the 2520, he's making an error. Right. That we would have to agree that that's not correct and that it's you can't just take a prophetic period and break it into pieces like that that are separated. Right. Those are the types of things people do with the, the 70 weeks. They try to take, oh, you know, this first 49 years applies over here and the 62 weeks. That applies in this other place. And then the final week, that's way off in the future. In, you know, in our time. Right. So there isn't a reason to break that 1260 in the way that Miller does. I mean, I'm sure you all agree with me, but you can see that it's it's wrong. Right? So Miller's wrong about that. Now, there are people who argue that Miller is correct, that they, they don't accept the 2520 for Samaria, right, for northern Israel. They only accept what Miller says so you, so you can see, though, that Miller misses this. He, he can't say that the, the scattering of the power of the holy people begins in 677. Because when does the scattering begin? It has to begin in 722 or 723, really, with the captivity of, of Hoshea, two years before Samaria is destroyed. So hopefully people can see that. Now, what we wanted to really discuss is the importance of this 45 years. So we had this, this comment about the 45 years that it should be 46. Now, I understand that there is 46 years in the prophetic mirror, right? That is, if we have 723, you're going you're gonna to have 742, 19 years to 723, and then 46 years. So in the prophetic mirror, there is... So I'm just going to, I'm going to copy this. So I'm going to put the correct one. So this is Miller's. Maybe I'll put this here. This is Miller's understanding. Okay, so this is Miller's understanding of the prophetic periods of Daniel 12. So in a sense, he, he creates this 25, 20 years from this structure, right? So he's, he's taking the 1335. Um, and I'm going to get, oh. I'm going to put this one here. Uh, let me see. I'll do it this way. I'm just going to put a different, just it's a different dash. So, okay, so this one's not recognized by Miller. I'm going to do it this way. Okay, so we got that not recognized by Miller, but all the other ones Miller recognizes. Okay, now let's do, so here we're going to have 723, 19 years. 46 years, and I'm going to leave that 215 in there. I'll call it Miller's 215 years. And we then would have this moved over. Okay. That makes sense. So you got the 46 years. It's just not, I guess I could put that as a, so if we, so that's 2520, that's 1260, that's 2520. Everything looks okay there. So now we have this 45 years. Now the 45 years end in 1843. Technically speaking, 
the Jewish year, 1843, when it ends, completes the 45 years from 1798. So we know that the 1335 and the 1290 were not affected by the fact that there was no zero year. So <clears throat> when they made the chart in 1842, in May and June of 1842, they have the 1843 chart. So it's called the 43 chart, not because it, it was made in 1843, but because it ends in 1843. And the mistake on the chart was not at the bottom. So at the bottom of the chart, I have a chart here, and it says 1798 plus 45 equals 1843. And then it says 508 plus 1335 equals 1843. So at the bottom, it has two 1843. So I don't know. You probably can't see it in that diagram behind me there. But... Um, that's not a mistake. The math is correct. We know that 508 to 1335 is 1843. And they took that year as being from January 1st, 1843 to December 31st, 1843. That's when the chart was made. They actually understood that to be the year on our calendar. And that's why when Samuel Snow gives his testimony on January 31st, 1843, that's the end of Miller's uh, understanding. Now, it's going to be uh, prior to the end of 1843 that Miller is going to, and I believe it's in December, that's at least as close as I can narrow it down, that he's going to say that he understands that it's the Jewish year 1843 that's going to go from March 21st, 1843 to March 21st, 1844. Now, March 21st is just the equinox. So he's, he's using the equinox as a determination of when the Jewish year begins. He doesn't fully understand the Jewish calendar. He just knows that it's in the spring. Now, the Millerites are going to be, uh, looking at this. Um, so, so it's in 18, December of 1842. So they make the chart in 1842. In May, June, in December of 1842, Miller says that the Jewish year 1843 is going to begin in March 21st, 1843. So he's not going to be marking the time that Jesus can come back in like January 1st, 1843. He's going to say, no, it's not till the spring. So the earliest that they can look for Christ to return is in the spring of 1843. Now, after after 1843 has begun in the spring of 1843, and I believe it's in May of 1843, I think it's May 2nd, uh, Miller writes a letter talking about the seventh month. And he says that he believes that Christ will come back in connection with the fall types in the fall of 1843. Now, this is where Samuel Snow comes into the movement as a preacher and he's really keen on the idea that Jesus is coming back in the fall of 1843 and is disappointed when Christ doesn't return in the fall of 1843. And so he begins studying to figure out why did Jesus not come back in the fall of 1843, like Miller suggested. And he comes to the conclusion before the end of that year, 1843, when he gives his testimony on December 31st, 1843, he already has come to the conclusion that Jesus is coming back in the fall of 1844. And it's going to be the next day that he decides he's going to start proclaiming this. So he says, on January 1st, I'm going to make the decision. I'm going to not look for Christ at the end of the Jewish year, 1843, in the spring of 1843. He believes that it's going to be in the fall. Of, or not 1843, the Jewish year 1843 ending, you know, which at that time they're still going to kind of think it's, they're, they're just starting to understand the Jewish calendar a little bit. So, so there are some people who are saying, well, the Jewish year is going to start a month later, the correct Jewish year, because the Karaites always begin one month later than the rabbis, which isn't correct. Actually, rarely do they start a month later. It's, so usually the same time. Um, and in 1844, it was. They, they would never, the Karaites would never start a year as late as April 19th. 
Um, they would only start the year one month later when the rabbinic calendar started it, like the first week of March sort of thing. And then the Karaites might start it a month later. Um, but sometimes they would even have it um, earlier because theirs was based upon the barley harvest. So there's a lot of sketchiness regarding that. But definitely the Karaites would never have eight, had April 19th, 1844 as the start of the year. That is the biblical start of the year. The Karaites, even though the Millerites used the name of the Karaites, they're actually incorrect. The Karaites did not have the correct calendar. So the point is here that uh, Samuel Snow is going to be looking to the fall. So he's going to be looking to the fall of 1844. And that's why, you know, he's going to have that letter written on uh, February 16th, 1844 to Southard, Brother Southard. And uh, that's going to be published in the Midnight Cry on February 22nd. It's going to be republished in the Signs on April 3rd. So Snow's understanding there is is important here in regarding to 1843. Uh, they're going to have this understanding then that it's not May or March 21st, 1844. That's going to be the end of the Jewish year, 1843, but they're going to move it over to April. Sometimes they say April 17th, sometimes April 18th, and sometimes April 19th. So they, they have a, they're still trying to pin that down. So Samuel Snow doesn't fully understand the biblical calendar. He never says that Jesus is coming back October 22nd, 1844. He just says the 10th day of the seventh month. Other people have to determine when that is based on, on how they understand the calendar. Okay. So that's a lot background information. A lot of us are familiar with that. So now we have these 45 years. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh. So we're going to start looking at this in Daniel chapter 12. Any, any questions about any of this that, that I've gone over so far? So the scattering of the power of the holy people, it says he's going to accomplish to scatter the power of the holy people. All these things shall be finished. Now, Miller is taking that all these things is referring to all these things. So that's when Christ returns. But that's not really uh, what's going to be finished. Right. It's not it's not talking about Christ's second coming here. So how do we do this? So this is the scattering of the power of the holy people. All these all these shall be finished. So. Remember, there's these, those, in Hebrew, there's no distinction, right? Or this, it could be translated as all of this shall be finished, whatever he's he's talking about. So how do we do this? How do we go back? So you got the time of the end. People shall run to and fro. Knowledge shall be increased. And Daniel looked. Behold, there stood other two, one on this side, the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. So what do these two refer to? These other two. There stood other two. Why is there two angels, one on one side of the bank of the river and one on the other? What, what do we understand about this? What is it? What is this scene portraying? You have Christ in the middle, one on one side of the bank of the river, one on the other side of the bank of the river. Christ is in the waters in the midst of the river. He's on the waters themselves. Okay, so we... We talked about this. Somebody have any thoughts on this? I want you want you to think this through. So Daniel looks right, and and we already looked at at the symbols involved here, these symbols of time, and and behold. So behold means to see. Look means to see. So two different words. Daniel's going to look and see, right? And there stood other two, right? That is, there's two, one on this side. So this side is uh, henna. This side, the bank of the river. And the other on that side of the bank of the river. So we notice that he's going to behold is number 209. And, this, and on this side and on that side is number 208. And henna which is hither or thither, behold, hina, which means behold, and it's from 205. And the other one's from 204. So we looked at these words. 
204, 205, 208, 209. And, and so there's some relationship between these words. So we got one on one side, one on the other side, in Christ in the middle. So this is a chiasm, right? Yes. Okay. So we have a chiasm and, and we have talked about these numbers 208 and 209 that might, these might represent years and that we could take these Hebrew numbers from 2001 at least to 2019 and, and we could maybe 2020, maybe 2021, maybe, maybe 2023. But and we haven't looked at that in detail yet. We might later on, but this is a chiasm. So we have a chiasm and there's going to be two prophetic periods that are going to be addressed in the book of Daniel. So remember, the answer is not given completely in verse seven. So when it says, how long shall be the end of these wonders? Verse seven doesn't give the complete answer, right? The rest of the chapter gives the answer. Do we agree with that? That looks logical. Yeah, because he's going to give it in parts. Okay. And, and when we looked up the word wonders, we saw that this is this word palu, or which, which is part of palmani. So, uh, pale, uh, which is part of palmani. It's the pal part, um, of the wonderful number. And so he's going to give some numbers. He's going to give a time times a half. He's going to give, uh, um, 1290 days and 1335 days. And so he's going to give these three different numbers. And we know that there's going to be these 45 years in there. And so we looked at that with what Miller said. But let's look at this a bit more carefully now. So it shall be for times, times and a half. And then it says, and when he shall have accomplished. Now, you can see that you got one, two, three, four, five, six English words for one Hebrew word. That's 6515, kala, which means to end, right? You have, um, and then you have this word finished again, right? So this 65 uh, or 3615 which also means to end, right? So sometimes we have uh, we have different words, but here we have accomplished in this case. They're the same word. And um, we're going to have <clears throat> uh, 319 in the next sentence where he's going to say, oh, Lord, what shall be the end of these things, right? So, so you're going to have accomplished, and then you're also going to have this other question about ending. So even though they both mean end, uh, this one means what comes after. It also can be the last or end. It's the future. And we know that Daniel is in the period of the daily still, right? He's not in the period of the abomination of desolation. He's still in that first period. He's in the period of the scattering of the power of the holy people. Now, we know that Israel was scattered and it was gathered at this time, what Daniel's looking for is, you know, the rebuilding of the temple and people returning to the land of Israel. Not exactly in that order. Right. So they're going to return to Jerusalem. They're going to rebuild the temple. All of those things. That's what he's concerned about. Now, he understands the 70 weeks and the 2300 days, but he doesn't fully understand the 2520 and how it relates uh to those other prophetic periods. That's what Daniel 10, 11, and 12 is about. So it says, when he shall have finished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So if we look at it that way, we have to say, well, what are these things that are going to be finished? Yeah, Iran has noticed 33615 three, if you rotated the six is three nine one five which which I've noticed. Okay. So to accomplish to scatter the power of the holy people, let's look at some other translations of of this. So um okay, that's not the one I want to want to compare. There we go. That's not the verse I want. Let's go back. Now, um, this is uh, the ABP. Uh, this is from actually a translation from the Greek. But uh, it says that for the time and times and a half a time in the completing the dispersing hand of people having been sanctified, 
they shall know all these things. So there's the King James, Bishop's Bible, uh, when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished, basically the same as the King James. Um, but Brenton has, when the dispersion is ended, they shall know all these things. Everything will be over when the suffering of God's people comes to an end. When the scattering of the power of the holy people shall be accomplished, all these things shall be finished. Again, that one's the same. Uh, the power of the holy people will be broken when all these things will finally come true. That's the English Revised Version, the English Standard Version. When the scattering of the holy people comes to an end, all these things will be would be finished. So most of them are going to say it like that, like the King James. Got a lot of different translations here that you can't read. The scattering of the power of holy people shall be finished. All these things shall be fulfilled. So most are going to just have finished. Some have completed and accomplished instead of accomplished and finished. This one here has, and when they have made an end of scattering the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So they translate it as end instead of accomplished. Made an end of scattering the power of the holy people. All these things shall be finished. It's the modern King James Version. They don't use accomplished. They use end. And it's Romanian translations there. And when they have ended scattering the power of the set-apart people, then all these shall be completed. Um, so most of them are... And after a time, times and a half, at the completion of the scattering of the power of holy people, finished are all these. That's Young's literal translation. Okay, so so we have these different translations. Um, now, some people have about this understanding these things, but we know that the same word that's translated as accomplished is finished. But you can see the problem of saying, when he when all these things are ended, when he has ended the scattering of the power of the holy people, all these things are ended, right? It, like if you translate it that way, what what is the problem we see with that? Do you understand what I'm asking here? Like it doesn't make sense to say if if we're just taking it the way that that Miller is taking it, when he shall have ended ended to scatter the power of the holy people, it's ended, right? That is that the scattering of the power of the holy people has to be accomplished, but that's not what is finished or ended, right? There's something else going on there. So how could, how could we understand this? That it's not just straightforward, that when the time times and a half end, that all these things are finished. Because what's going to be finished, according to what this verse says? Are all things finished at the end of the 1260, either 1260s? Yes. All things are finished at the end of the, in 1798, all things are finished? No, you're asking, you asked the question before about the 1260 that we're applying to right now. Okay, so so we got the 1260 here, but I'm just saying that either one of them are all things finished. Like in 538, are all things finished? No. Okay, in 1798, all things are not finished. Correct. Miller's going to say, well, because it says all things shall be finished, he's wanting this period, the scattering of the power of the holy people, to be finished in 1843. Right? That's how he's reading it. So he's saying, well, that period started in 677. It was interrupted by 1260 years of the papacy. And then the kings of the earth reign again for another 45 years. But it can't be what it means, no matter how you take this, even if you apply this to the 1260 of the papacy, it wouldn't be true that all these things shall be finished. So there must be some other way to understand why he says, when this has been finished, all these things shall be finished. You understand what I'm I'm getting at? Because there's a question of how long shall be the end of these wonders. And, and this doesn't really make sense. What's this, this answer? If we just took 12 verse 7 as the answer to the question, it doesn't make sense. That means there's more to the answer than just verse 7. So when we read it, it just says all these things shall be finished. That is, they shall be completed. But they aren't completed. 
Now, because of that, Daniel says, I heard, but I did not understand what he was talking about. Do we understand why he didn't understand? That verse 7 by itself doesn't make any sense in response to the question of how long. Now, one person on one bank of the river talks about the time, times and a half. And he says, when he shall have ended the scattering of the power of the holy people. Now, remember, this when he shall have accomplished is one Hebrew word. The when, is is that correct? Can we say that it says when in there? Right. So if we look again at, at the Hebrew, it's going to give us one word accomplished. But they're going to have and when he shall have accomplished. Now, when we look at this, this word, um, so uh, let's see if I can find this here. So Daniel chapter. OK, so it's um, OK, so this word accomplished. And so this is an inseparable pre- preposition verb, PPL, infinitive construct root to accomplish those three, six, one, five. Um, so it's uh, got the vav, which is the and. It has uh, a kaf, which is like the c sound, not the k sound, if that makes sense. It's not the kof, but the kaf. There's two of them, and that would mean they. And then it has uh, chala, so kala, so kalot, um, so kalavot. Ukala uke kala kalvot. So it's in the infinitive construct. There's no tense. So I don't know if when is, I'm just trying to figure out other ways in which it could be translated. So when we look at Young's, right? So he says, after a time, times and a half, and at the completion of the scattering of the power of the holy pe- people, finished are all these. So all these are finished. So is there any way in which we can try to make this make sense? Because it can't be that when the, this period of time ends, that everything is finished, even though that's what it says, right? That's what it appears to say. All these things shall be finished when the scattering of the power of the holy people has been finished, right? And that finished means uh, to end. That's going to cease. And it says all that is coal, the whole, hence all, any, or every. So it can't mean all in the sense of everything, right? It's just saying that there's going to be something that's going to be finished, but it's part of something. Do people understand what, what I'm getting at here? That, that we can't take this, that all these things are finished in 1798 or in 538, and that This is why Daniel's having trouble understanding what's being said, because he's going to understand the time, times and a half of scattering the account, because he knows the scattering of the holy people has already been going on. And it's going to be for 1260 years. So he says, I heard, but understood not. Then said I, oh, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? So again, he's going to use another word. What's going to happen after this? And he says, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white and tried. So the time of the end is not at the end of the 1260 that's referred to here. This is a future time. Now, the time of the end has already been referred to. Right. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, it's going to talk about the time of the end. And at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him. So. So Daniel's going to be opened up in chapter 11, verse 40, the events that are there. Okay, so he's going to be said, so they're closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white and tried. You know that that refers uh, back to uh, Daniel 11, verse, I always forget which verse is it. Do you remember which verse it is? Yeah, verse 35. And some of them of understanding shall fall, right? Understanding, you know, the the ones who understand the wise, to try them, to purge them, to make them white, right? So this is 
even to the time of the end, for it is yet for a time appointed. So this is referring to that 45 years. From 1798, well, it gets 46 years, to 1844. Okay? So they're going to be purified, made white, and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Then he says, from the time that the daily shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. So the daily is taken away in 508, and there's going to be 1,290 days to 1798. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to 1,305 and 30 days. So we have a number of questions that we, we, we don't really have answers to. I don't, I don't know if I have answers to them, but they're good questions. So the question is, why is Daniel chapter 12 going to give us the 1290 and not the 1260 for the papacy? Why are they going to start with 508 and go to 1798? Why are we going to get the 1335 as well? Anybody got ideas on how we could show this and, and that, that this is significant? Like why this occurs? Any thoughts? I mean, wouldn't it be much simpler if Daniel just said, you know, there's 1260, you know, a time times and a half for the scattering of the power of the holy people. And in this same chapter said, you know, there's going to be uh, 1260 days, you know, time times and a half um, for the abomination of desolation. The, the daily is is a time times and a half. And the abomination of desolation is a time times and a half. And then, you know, blessed is he and waiteth that cometh to the um what would be that uh, 1200 and or 1305 days right something like that <clears throat> instead of the 30 1335 days so is there some reason that we can find why the wonderful number why palmoni is going to give us this structure instead of what we would want is there something here that we need to to see. Now, now what about 1335? What what do we notice about 1335 as a number? Okay, so it's connected to 1533. So God is giving us symbols here that we need to recognize. So we have this 1335. We can say, well, it relates symbolically to an iteration of 1533. Right? So it's going to relate to the 1533 days from August 11th, 1840 to October 22, 1843, 1844. Okay. Now, what about 1335 itself? Okay. 666 plus 666 is what? Okay, let's look at it this way. Now, um, the number 36, 36 is a shorthand for 666. Why is that? We know it has to do with, with the the divisions of the sky into 36 sections, right? 36 constellations. The Babylonians divide the circle into 360 degrees. And we know that uh, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 up to plus 36 is 666. So this 1335 is 666 plus 666, right? But it's short by three years. How many months is three years? Is there 36 months? So if we add 36 months, so we could say this is 666 plus 666 plus 36 months, correct? So where do we get the 36 from? I mean, obviously we know it's from the Babylon. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump over here to, to something else. And we just finish off with this. So we're, we're, we're obviously not really finished with this topic yet. We still haven't really answered the question. Stephen sent me this while he put it on the unity chat. So what is this? We see 2300 degrees Fahrenheit is equal to 1260 degrees Celsius. Now, now degrees Celsius are based upon nature. That is, we know that Celsius, the way that we get our degrees, has to do with the idea that there is 100 degrees 
between the freezing point of water and the boiling point of water. So that's where we get Celsius from. We're just, we're just dividing something natural into 100. Fahrenheit is not based upon nature. Right? There, there is not a reason for Fahrenheit. It, it's arbitrary. But degree Celsius is not arbitrary. And we know that if you go to absolute zero, it's going to be 273 degrees below zero in Celsius to get absolute zero. So you've got the 273 there also with the temperature. Now, we also have this. If we take 2300 degrees Celsius, we get 4172 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, if we subtract 2300 from 4172, what do we get? We get 1872. Now, another thing that we looked at was just dealing with where's that? Where's what I want? Okay, I don't see what I want. These are dealing with the elements. Okay, I don't see this here. Okay. So anyway, um, does anybody know the melting point of of cast iron? The melting point of cast iron is twenty three hundred degrees Fahrenheit or twelve hundred and sixty degrees Celsius. And cast iron is made up of, was it, was it manganese, silicon, uh, carbon? So carbon, silicon, manganese, and iron. Obviously cast iron is made out of iron, right? But that's, that was given to us. So yeah, so carbon, silicon, manganese, and, and iron. So C for carbon, SI for silicon, MN for manganese, and FE for iron. So this, this 1260 degrees Celsius and 2300 degrees Fahrenheit, the fact that this is the melting point of cast iron, is that significant? Well, it's got the 1260 in it, so it must be. <laughs> yeah, and it's got the 2300 in there as well, right? So, That's right. Yeah, so, so I think it's significant. You know, I don't, I don't know fully all of the significance of it, but when we relate this to, you know, what we're studying here right now in Daniel, so we know that these, these periods of time are dealing with different metals, right? We got gold, silver, brass, iron, and then we have iron mixed with clay. And cast iron, well, it's got silicone in it and um, you know, manganese and uh, carbon. So you can kind of say that's, you know, iron mixed with clay. I don't know. But it's something that we're going to have to consider. So when we come back to this on Sunday, uh, I'm going to try to finish this up be before I go to Australia. I'm flying Sunday evening. So Sunday morning, we're going to look at this again. Any final questions before we close with prayer? I know I, I wanted to get more done today, but... Um, we, we should be able to see, we should be able to tie this up and see why Daniel 12 is saying the things that it's saying in the way that it's saying it. So even the 1335 has symbols in it. All of these are symbols. All of these numbers, they're not, they're not chosen randomly. Okay. So let's uh, close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study today. Thank you for each person that has participated. We know, Lord, that uh, there's still more that we need to see in your word. And we just ask that you can help us as we study through these things on our own. May your Holy Spirit continue to work in our lives, bringing conviction and power. May we reflect your character in all that we do. We pray for the studies tomorrow night and Sabbath and all the plans we have uh, moving forward. We just ask that uh, you can guide and direct us, that your angels can watch over us. And we pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.